Hi again. Uh, in this video, I'm going to do a bit of clustering uh, both uh, with KMIS and some other approaches as well as DBSCAN. But let's start with the easiest one, which is KMIS. And uh, what we want to do, basically the idea is that we want to group observations into K different groups. Remember that K-means clustering is one of the most common clustering techniques and in K-means clustering the algorithm attempts to group observations into K groups which each group having roughly equal variance. The number of groups is specified by user which is us as a hyperparameter. Uh, so let's see how it works here. So uh, let's first uh, load the libraries we need, and I'm going to use the uh, Scalar own dataset, specifically the Iris dataset we have used before as well. And we want to do some a standard uh, Scalar thing as well, and the K-means algorithm. So let's load load the libraries. I'm then going to load the data. This is all what we have done before. Then I'm going to uh, standardize the data. And uh, and after that, uh, we we need to build uh, the k-mean object. Of course, I have cheated here a bit, and I know that we have three different clusters. So I am going to put uh, the k equals uh, three. Uh, and and since k-means clustering is computationally expensive, we might want to take advantage of all the cores on computer. So that is where I use the end jobs equal to minus one. So let's do this as well. And then it is uh, quite easy. I'm going to uh, train my model. And then I'm going to use the model uh, label to uh, predict uh, the, uh, to view the predicted classes here. And as you can see, uh, if we uh, had computed it correctly, we should be uh, seeing three different classes here. And as you see, we also have it. If you see the true class as well, you can see uh, it is more or less there, of course. Uh, as you might imagine, the performance of K-mean drops considerably even critically if we selected the wrong number of clusters. And finally, uh, uh, as with other scikit-learns, we, we can use a train cluster to predict the new values. So let's a new, create a new observation here, uh, getting some random values to different features, and then uh, it, it basically says that it belongs to the cluster uh, zero. Uh, you could also see the clusters uh, centers, but it at the moment without visualizing it doesn't mean much. Uh, let's uh, speed up the k-mean clustering as well. The problem is that we want to group observation into k groups, but uh, k-means takes too too long. And what we are planning to do is here here is to use mini batches of k-means. And let's see what does that mean. Let's load the libraries again, and instead, this time, instead of loading k-means, I'm using to load mini-batch k-means. And the rest is more or less the same. I load the data, I standardize the data. Uh, the, the differences here is basically, uh, and I don't want to get into much more detail, but the difference is that in mini batch k means the most computational costliest step is conducted only on a random uh, sample of observation as opposed to all observation. And this approach can significantly reduce the time required for the algorithm to find the convergence, which is the fitting the data. Mini batch k means works similarly uh, to k means this one here. Uh, with one significant difference, and that is the batch size parameter. Batch size controls the number of randomly selected observations in each batch. The larger the size of the batch, the more computationally costly the training process will be. But other than that, 
everything is the same and then fitting is more or less the same as well. Uh, let's look at another uh, clustering approach and that is clustering using mean shift. Here we want to group the observation without assuming the number of clusters or their shapes. And if you remember, uh, one of the disadvantages of k-mean clustering, as we discussed, uh, is that we need to set the number of clusters prior to training. And the method made assumptions about the shape of the clusters. Uh, one clustering approach that doesn't have this limitation is mean shift. And mean shift is a simple concept, uh, but at the same time probably a bit difficult to explain. So let me give you an analogy, probably that is easier. Think about a foggy uh, football field, uh, two-dimensional feature space, with 100 people standing on it, which are our observation. Because it is foggy, a person can only see a short distance. Every minute, each person looks around and takes a step in the direction of the most people they can see. As time goes on, people start to group up as they repeatedly take steps toward the larger crowds. And the end result is the clusters of people around the field. And uh, people are assigned to the cluster in which they end up. So this is how more or less the mean shift work. Uh, the basic logic of mean shift is the same, and I'm going not going to say the mathematical formulation or anything anyway, it's a hands-on practice. But mean shift has two important parameters that we should be aware of. First, the bandwidth, which is setting the radius of the area, that is the kernel, that an observation uses to determine the direction to shift. And in an in analogy, uh, the bandwidth was how far a person could see through the fog. We can set this parameter manually, but by default, a reasonable bandwidth is estimated automatically which of course is a significant increase in the computational cost. Second, sometimes in mean shift, there are no other observation within observ observation kernel. Uh, that is a person on our football field cannot see a single other person. By default, mean shift assigns all these orphan observation to the kernel of the nearest observation. However, if we want to leave out these orphans, we can set the cluster all equal to false, where orphans observation are given the label minus one. And it is like, as you see here, we just import mean shift instead of k means, the, the rest is the same cluster, mean shift, and then let's see how it does here. And as you see, it really didn't exactly uh, found our three clusters. It only decided that we can do well with two clusters. Okay. Uh, I talked about this hierarchical clustering at some point. Uh, basically, what we, we are doing here is to group the observations into clusters. And we are losing agglomerative clustering, which is a powerful, flexible, hierarchical clustering algorithm. Uh, here, basically, all observations start at their own cluster. And next, uh, uh, clusters meeting some criteria are merged together. And this process is repeated, growing the cluster until some point is reached. Uh, and in agglomerative clustering, in uh, scikit-learn, uh, the method that is loose is linkage parameter uh, to determine the merging strategy to minimize the following thing. Uh, variance of the merged clusters, average distance between the observations from pairs of clusters, and maximum distance between the clusters. So let's see, basically everything is more or less the same. We only use agglomerative clustering and we put the number of clusters to zero uh, to three. And then as you see, we predict the labels as such here. Okay, uh, but I already said in the class that, in the video lecture, that DBS scan is uh, probably 
one of the better clustering approaches uh, that we we need to try. And in this example here, I'm going to apply DBS scan clustering on a data set and compare the result with k-means and hierarchical clustering, see which one is working better. But first, let's start by importing the libraries we need. And these are some standard libraries. I'm going to import anything that I need along the way. And then I'm going to create a data set with only two features so that we can visualize it easily. And uh, we have uh, created a function points in circum, which takes a radius and number of data points as argument, and then returns an array of data points that are plotted as a circle. So this is the function. And after that, uh, since one sort of circle is not sufficient for uh, the clustering ability of DBS scan, uh, we here in this example have three different uh, circles uh, inside each other with the same center point. And I'm also adding a bit of noise to the data to see how well, how well it is performing with the noise. We are going to see the figure soon enough. So let's see how does it look like. So this is uh, basically our data set. So we have three uh, circles that are inside each other, in each other, and there are some noise as well. So let's just start with k-means, see how well it is going to perform here. So I'm already saying four clusters. And now I have trained the KMI model, see how it has done the clustering. As you can see, uh, it didn't really work that well, specifically with noise. It included the noises in the clusters as well. So it didn't really uh, cluster the data into uh, four clusters, basically three cycles and noise that I expected it to have. How about hierarchical clustering? And this is this agglomerative clustering that you have already seen. Again, the number of clusters is four. Um, here, not either. It didn't uh, cluster the points that we wanted. Let's get to the DBS scan. So uh, we, d we import DBS scan from a scale learn cluster. And first, uh, let's run a DBS scan without assigning any parameters. So this is DBS scan, and then I basically fit it. And uh, here the epsilon is uh, 0.5, and the mean samples is 5. So let's see how it works. As you see, interestingly enough, all data points are now purple color, which means they are treated as noise. And it is because the value of, of epsilon is very small and we didn't optimize the parameters. So we need to find a value of the epsilon and mean point and then, then we train our model. For epsilon, I'm going to use k distance graph. And for plotting a k distance graph, we need the distance between points and its nearest point for all data uh, data set. And we use that by uh, using nearest neighbor from the scale learn. OK. Uh, the distance uh, variable constates an area of distance between data points and its nearest point. Now let's plot our graph, and then that is easier to get what we want. So this is our k distance graph, and the epsilon is basically clear. The optimum value of epsilon is the point of maximum curvature in the k distance. And here, you can see it's like around 30 uh, in this case. So this, this is what I put my epsilon for. And then the value of mean points also depends on the no, uh, domain knowledge. This time I'm taking mean point as six. So let's let's put that randomly like that. Uh, and now I have some parameters and let's do this again once more. Uh, 
and here we come. As you see, it uh, very nicely clustered the data points in three circles and noise are also represented in purple color. Uh, as you can see, really choosing the proper values in DBS scan is important. It needs uh, a bit of gymnastics, let's say, and trying with different values. So even if you don't have the domain knowledge and you don't know the exact uh, mean sample values, you can try with a few values until you get where you think is the best place for you to be. So by that, I uh, finish the video of clustering here and I see you in the next one.